Welcome to Wednesday's edition of COVID-19. A growing number of countries are contemplating the adoption of booster shots amid the presence of variants and breakthrough infections. But this potential adoption mostly by privileged countries looks to further disrupt supplies to their less privileged counterparts. We have more on this later on the program. Here first are the pandemic updates with our Kwon Soa. Now Soa, just start us off then. Sure, Sunny. It is Wednesday, and Wednesday usually means a rise in COVID-19 infections. Now, the cases have surged to above 1,800 as of 12 a.m., and that includes 1,767 domestic transmissions. By region, we are seeing a surge in cases in the capitals holding Gyeonggi-do province, both from the 300s now to the 500s, and also triple digits down in Gyeongsangnam-do province and Busan, especially a surge here in the port city of Busan was reported this Wednesday. And with that, Korea has a total of 228,657 COVID-19 infections. And with five additional fatalities, the death toll has risen to 2,178. Now, it took just three days to get back to the 1,800 level here, as you can see. Uh, and uh, this is also a little higher than the daily average in the past week, which stands uh, below 1,000. 800. Now, if you take a look at uh, Wednesday's figures in the recent weeks, now you might think that we have a glimmer of hope here as uh, we are seeing a decline, a significant decline compared to last week when the country hit an all-time high of 2,222 infections. Uh, but uh, we have to factor in that this past Monday was still a national uh, holiday here in the country, which means it is likely that we had fewer tests. So uh, there are experts saying that we might see the usual surge that we see on Wednesday rather on Thursday this week. I see. Hopefully that will not be the case. Right, so let's turn to our inoculation front. What's the latest there? Well, first off, Sunny, uh, the country has surpassed 10 million vaccinations when it comes to fully vaccinated people as of yesterday, and that's equivalent to 20.4 percent. Uh, meanwhile, vaccine bookings for regular citizens aged 18 to 49 based on a 10 day rotation system ends on Thursday, 6 p.m. with people whose last digit of their birth date ends with eight uh, able to make their reservation beginning at 8 p.m. this Wednesday. Now, uh, late registration is also available for the following three days uh, for people who have missed the chance to do so earlier. Prime Minister Kim bu gyeon meanwhile, earlier this morning, called a more active vaccine participation uh, by all kinds of age groups, uh, citing an increase in COVID-19 patients with serious symptoms even among the younger population. And also, he noted that the vaccine reservation rate for seniors aged 60 to 74 uh, was rather low with additional reservations ending this Wednesday. And uh, this group, I'm talking about the people who were not vaccinated in the first half of the year. Now, the prime minister stressed the importance of protection against the Delta variant, especially when it comes to senior citizens. Now, what Kim and also other officials have been mentioning this Wednesday is that the government is looking to make reasonable adjustments on social distancing measures. Uh, but whether that means some kind of relaxation was not clear. Containing the virus isn't easy due to the spread of the Delta variant. But on the other hand, vaccinations are progressing steadily, which is why we're reviewing adjustments to social distancing while considering a range of different factors. What Son did mention is that the measures which are to take effect beginning Monday are expected to be announced this Friday after a thorough review with health experts and officials. There have been requests by businesses and fatigued citizens for revisions to intensive measures going on for more than a month. The capital region has been under the highest level four for the sixth week and level three in most other places for the fourth week. Now, separately from that, beginning this Wednesday until the 29th, we will have Jeju-do Island under the toughest level four social distancing measures. So with that, we now got six regions in the nation under the strictest measures. Let's now shift over to global updates. Uh, we're seeing over 692,000 infections in the past 24 hours as of New Korea time, and also more than 11,000 new fatalities. Uh, for a closer look at 
at uh, some specific countries. Uh, the U.S. Uh, saw over 159,000 new infections, while Brazil also had some 38,000 cases now at 20.4 million. Uh, the country is now also considering booster shots. Uh, meanwhile, over in Iran, this country has posted its highest ever daily caseload of over 50,000. And those are the updates I have for now. We will have a closer look at some of these countries with our G. Abby Lee in a bit. And back to you, Sonny. All right. So as always, thank you very much for that. I'll see you on Thursday. My pleasure. Right now, so I said, for a more global coverage, that is, of the pandemic, I have our G. Abby Lee joining me in the studio. Welcome, G. Hi, Sunny. Right now, I believe authorities in Australia are scrambling to stem a resurgence, as are most of their counterparts elsewhere. That's right. So in today's segment, we'll talk about the surge in cases there in the U.S. and where the virus likely originated from, China. On Tuesday, Australian authorities warned residents in its largest city of Sydney to brace for a steep rise in the COVID-19 infection rates in the coming weeks. Let's hear from the top official of New South Wales, where Sydney is located. Message that case numbers in the next two or three weeks will bounce around and are likely to go up substantially. And we have to brace ourselves for that. But our key aim will be keeping people out of hospital and keeping people alive. In an effort to prevent overcrowding at hospitals, the Premier urged people to get vaccinated. The warning comes as deaths and infection rates have both hovered around record levels this week. Naturally, Sydney, which is the epicenter of the country's outbreak, has toughened lockdown rules. The local government set up roadblocks in parts of the city and increased fines on violators of the stay-at-home orders. I see. Gee, have these measures been effective then? Well, not as well as the authorities had hoped. Sydney's strict lockdowns are now in their eighth week, but the number of confirmed cases from the Delta outbreak is continuing to rise. On Tuesday, New South Wales reported 452 cases, its third biggest one-day rise during the pandemic, and one new death. Australia has 21% of its population fully vaccinated. In related news, New Zealand will enter a nationwide lockdown after the country confirmed one coronavirus case, the first locally transmitted COVID-19 case on the island nation since February. Right, since February. Meanwhile, over in the U.S., I understand vaccine hesitancy there remains a challenge, G. Well, in certain pockets of country, that's certainly the case. As you know, Sunny, the U.S. conducted its inoculations at lightning speed thanks to the country's robust pharmaceutical industry. Moderna and Pfizer are both U.S. companies and produce two of the most coveted vaccines around the world. As of last Sunday, CDC data shows 50.7% of Americans have been fully vaccinated, a whopping 168 million people. But the U.S. inoculation rate could have been even higher. Now, the issue in the U.S. is not that there aren't enough vaccines, but that not enough people are up for the jabs. Let's hear from a nurse working in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's truly um, lack of vaccination. Um, lack of vaccination, lack of education, lack of trust in uh, science and the healthcare system. Arkansas is reporting record numbers of COVID-19 hospitalizations this month, along with Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Oregon. Children make up about 2.4% of the nation's COVID-19 hospitalizations. Kids under 12 are not eligible to receive the vaccine, making them more vulnerable to the Delta variant. The CDC announced numbers of new COVID-19 patients at hospitals aged 18 to 29, 30 to 39 and 40 to 49 also hit record highs this week. Media reports say the U.S. now has an average of about 129,000 new coronavirus cases per day, a rate that has doubled in about two weeks. Later this week, Washington is widely expected to recommend booster shots to its citizens eight months after their second doses. Right, then let's move over to neighboring China. What is the situation there like, G? Well, the new local COVID-19 infections in China are on a declining trend, but local governments are still keeping vigilant. On Sunday, China reported 13 new domestically transmitted COVID-19 cases, its lowest daily tally since July 24th. Unlike other countries, though, Beijing doesn't include asymptomatic infections in its confirmed case count. Over the weekend, two cities in the central province of Henan started a fourth round of mass tests. 
We notified residents in different buildings of multiple communities to receive testing in varied time frames, so as to make sure that the sampling can be completed in no more than 30 minutes at the testing sites. The state-run Xinhua News Agency reported five officials in the provincial city of Shangqi have been stripped of their roles over negligence in containment efforts. That's all for me today. I'll be back same time next week. All right, Jay, as always, thank you very much for the coverage. Thanks for having me. Right, also in the international arena, officials in Japan have extended their state of emergency in capital Tokyo as well as other regions to mid-September and have also expanded the measure to cover more prefectures. The decision follows last Friday's count of over 20,000 new infections. For more, I have Kosuke Takahashi live on the line. Kosuke, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Right, now Kusuke, Japan's daily tally has been on a relentless rise following its hosting of the 2020 Summer Olympics. How are authorities there explaining the alarming spread? Uh, the government denied any links between Olympics and recent spike in coronavirus. But I think there is a strong connection between coronavirus spike and the Tokyo Olympics. There are two reasons. Number one, holding the Olympics amid the pandemic made the general public feel in a highly optimistic mood. And then Japanese major TV stations, such as NHK, reported on Japanese athletes who got gold medals around the clock every day, rather than on a record high number of the coronavirus cases. As a result, people made loosening behavior and went out to meet friends and to eat dinner, regardless of the coronavirus nightmare. I also saw many people lining up for about one hour to take a photo at the Olympic rings in front of the Olympic National Stadium in Tokyo. Second, the, the so-called bubble system at the Olympics to, con to control COVID-19 was actually broken. For example, I went to Haneda Airport to check, to check if the bubble system is really working. Basically, foreign athletes and the Japanese pub public simply mingled in many places there and breathe the same air nearby, Sunny. I see. And so, Kosuke, what then is the general response to the current mm. situation in the country with regard to COVID-19? Okay. Japanese people are ex extremely frustrated with the Suga administration, which cannot stop the spread of the coronavirus. The most recent national poll found his disapproval rate climbed to 52% this month, the highest since the formation of the his cabinet in September 2020. Meanwhile, his approval rating dropped to 29%, which is below the 30%, which is, we say, danger zone seen by political observers. This is an indicator of the imminent government changes. Suga administration is strongly urging Japanese people to refrain from traveling as coronavirus cases spike to a new records in Tokyo and nationwide. But people don't listen to what government is saying People tend to think, why should we refrain from traveling during the summer vacation as government held Tokyo Olympics by welcoming tens of thousands of people from abroad? Sunny? I see. And against that backdrop, Kosuke, the Paralympics are poised to kick mm. off next week. What measures then are in place to ensure a safe event? Okay. Uh, I participated in Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike's press conference yesterday. She stressed three three intensive measures to contain the coronavirus during the Paralympic, Paralympic Games. First, to reduce the number of visitors coming to Japan intensively. Second, to manage athletes' behavior and activities and to manage their health intensively. Third, to review the medical system intensively. Governor Koike said athletes observe the rules at the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympic Games will also be a safe and secure event, she said. I see. Meanwhile, Kosuke, aside from the presence of the Delta variant, authorities in Japan earlier this month announced the detection of the Lambda variant, which also led to much controversy. Could you tell us why? Okay. Uh, so far, Japan has confirmed the only one case of Lambda variant infection. The first variant was detected in women in her 30s at Haneda Airport who arrived from Peru on July 20th. She had her Olympic accreditation card, meaning she was an Olympic visitor. People are scared about the possible widespread of the Lambda variant, which could replace the Delta variant. Honey? 
I see. So she was detected at the airport then on the 20th of July. Why was this yes. announced by the government on the 6th, I believe, of August? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so the government didn't announce it until the until Tokyo-based English language media, Daily Beast, first reported on August 6th. So there is a strong suspicion that the reason why government didn't announce it immediately is patient, patient was related to the Olympics. Government is now severely criticized by the general public about its cover-up. Sunny? I see. Kuske, one final question. How is the medical infrastructure in Japan dealing with the surge in cases there? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, with medical capacity reaching its limits, many people are currently being isolated at home in order to make a room for those who are... Some noise? Okay. In order to make room for those who are more seriously ill, the government has decided to hospitalize severe or high-risk patients preferentially by asking patients with moderate symptoms to isolate at home. Nationally, more than 7,000 people with mild symptoms are currently being isolated at home. In Tokyo alone, more than 20,000 people with moderate symptoms are now isolating at home. Some of them died because they suddenly and unexpectedly developed severe symptoms Asking patients to isolate at home could delay potentially life-saving treatment. This is becoming a very serious issue in Japan day by day, Sunny. I see. We can only pray for, the, for their, um, hopefully that this will end really soon. All right, Kosuke, as yes. always, thank you for the updates from Japan. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Right, back here on the local front, officials in Gyeonggi-do province are working to better cater to the accommodation needs of those who are required to go into quarantine for either having come into contact with an infected person or having flown in from abroad to take a look. It's been almost a year and a half since the pandemic broke out and with that, the number of people putting under self-quarantine has amounted to over 2 million as of June this year. In detail, a little over 1 million for having close contact with confirmed patients and 960,000 for traveling overseas. Those subject to a mandatory 14-day quarantine should separate the living space from their family members to prevent transmission at home. However, it's not possible for some people because they have many family members that they are living with or because there is no enough room. To support them, Puyang City in Gyeonggi-do province is operating a safe accommodation. The safe accommodation was launched in September last year to provide independent residents for those self-quarantining to prevent further infection between family members. This accommodation, one of the two places that the city is running, operates a total of 47 rooms. Those subject to self-quarantine may apply for admission, and among them, those who are deemed more necessary to be admitted will have priority. All processes in the safe accommodation are conducted non-face-to-face. -face. Once admitted, they will be assigned a single room with a private bathroom. You can use the internet and watch TV, and daily necessities such as toilet paper and water are also provided. During your stay at the quarantine facility, there aren't really a lot of things that you can do. But here, you will have three meals a day provided, and if you want, you can have your package too. As all of these services are provided free of charge, users are very much satisfied. Uh, 
In fact, many users leave thank you letters or send gifts to employees. 배고프다고 그러실 때 이제 도시락을 더 드린다거나 갑자기 필요한 물건들이 있거든요. 이제 예상치 못하게 그래서 그런 것들을 바로바로 바로 전해드렸을 때 저희도 만족하 저희도 기쁘고요. 그리고 받으시는 분들도 만족도가 높더라고요. So far, there have been about 1,045 safe accommodation users, and about 63 of them have tested positive for the virus. If these people were not to stay at this accommodation, their family members would have faced a risk of infection. Other local governments are also operating safe accommodations. They have signed agreements with certain accommodation facilities and partially support related costs. Those who are fully vaccinated in South Korea are eligible for the self-quarantine exemption, though. Due to the spread of the Delta variant and breakthrough infection cases, the government is currently revising the guidelines. Local governments are making their all-out efforts to ensure citizens' safety and convenience while fighting for the virus. This has been Shin Sebya. When I made that statement, it, it's a true statement that we believe sooner or later you will need a booster for durability of protection. Income countries have now administered almost 100 doses for every 100 people. Meanwhile, low-income countries have only been able to administer 1.5 doses for every 100 people due to lack of supply. With the Delta variant spreading and COVID-19 antibodies waning, debate over booster shots within privileged countries has been gaining momentum, much to the dismay of their less privileged counterparts. For more on this, I have Dr. David Kwak from Sunchang University Hospital. Welcome back, Dr. Kwak. Good afternoon. And joining the session virtually is Dr. Michael Angaroni at Northwestern University over in the U.S. Pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Angaroni. Happy to be here. I also have Dr. Richard Lessels at the University of KwaZulu-Natal over in South Africa. Good to have you with us, Dr. Lessels. Hello. We'll start here in the studio then. Dr. Kwak, let's begin then with the reasons for the adoption of booster shots. Well, uh, so the recent studies uh, have begun to report that those who are immunocompromised, people who are having certain disease that weakens their immune system, or uh, diseases like cancer that requires chemotherapy, once again, that uh, reduces your immune system, or having less of the antibody levels circulating in the body, uh, body uh, despite having been vaccinated for completion. Uh, so, and these are also the people who uh, once are exposed to the COVID-19 virus could have some uh, more serious consequences compared to uh, other healthy uh, people. So uh, it, it's an obvious choice for, for, uh, for a medical person uh, that uh, to boost their immune system against uh, this uh, COVID-19 virus, they decided to uh, jab them with an uh, extra shot of a uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Right. Meanwhile, Dr. Angaroni, before we touch upon the issue of booster shots, perhaps you could start with some details in the COVID-19 situation over in the U.S. where daily infections have been hitting well above 100,000 in recent days. Yes. So in the United States, we have been seeing marked increase in the number of uh, COVID-19 cases uh, throughout the country, but especially in uh, the South and the Southeastern United States. Um, they've been really hit hard with the numbers of cases, predominantly from the Delta variant, so over 90% of the cases uh, with the Delta variant. 
Um, fortunately, those that have been vaccinated um, uh, have not been hospitalized as frequently as the unvaccinated. So that's really been driving uh, this big surge uh, in the pandemic. And here in Chicago, we've been fortunate. We've seen increases in numbers of cases, uh, but we haven't seen the huge surge that's being seen in states like Texas and Louisiana and Florida. I see. Is it because there are more people vaccinated in Chicago? That's one of the thoughts. So in areas where there's a higher percentage of vaccination uh, amongst the population, both from for those over 65, but also those over 18, um, that that is offering some degree of protection or at least keeping people out of the hospital. So there are breakthroughs uh, that are occurring for vaccinated people, uh, but those people aren't going to the hospital like the unvaccinated. Right. And Dr. Lessels, what can you tell us about the COVID-19 situation over in South Africa? Yeah, so, so we're still uh, in the midst of a, of a kind of third wave of, of, of the epidemic driven by the, the Delta variant also. And we're unfortunately still seeing terrible suffering and, and, and death here and, and high numbers of, of deaths. Um, and that's partly because we had a late start to our vaccination program. And, and so when, when the Delta variant hit, hit South Africa, we really had very low numbers of people vaccinated. And, and so we've seen uh, rapid spread um, and, and continued um, cases and hospital admissions. Um, in many parts of the country, the hospitals have, have been uh, stretched beyond capacity in, the, in this third wave. Um, so, so, yeah, we're still in a, in, a, in a very dire situation here. Right. Dr. Kwak, what has been shared thus far about the efficacy and safety of booster shots? Well, uh, as the name already says, booster shots are meant to Im uh, boost the immune system. So obviously we would speculate, anticipate that with the booster shot, they are going to have better immunization against the virus. There hasn't been a specific numbers, I don't think that was put out because people who are getting the boost shots are have those people who have already either received two shots of uh, whatever the, the types of the vaccines might have been or one shot of for the completion. Um, so adding to that would not necessarily uh, defer in its efficacy because it's just an addition for the immunization uh, a boosting. Um, but that being said, I think uh, in regards to side effects, it hasn't been that different from uh, the other former two shots for the people, at least in Israel and other p uh, countries that have received boost shots already. Uh, they were showing very mild um, um, pain in the arm that, that uh, on the injection, also mild fever, um, tiredness, uh, the usual deal that we usually also have with regular schedule of two shots. So I don't think it's going to be uh, uh, very uh, worrisome uh, when we go into scheduling of uh, the booster shots. But I must also say that there has been only limited numbers uh, that we have uh, observed so far of the booster shots being shot and also for the cases that have received booster shots we haven't had enough time to really observe them that would have fought against with great efficacy against COVID-19 virus we haven't uh, had a formal study that came up with differences in efficacy uh, against this virus Right. Now then, Dr. Angaroni, do tell us about the adoption of booster shots over in the U.S. I understand at present these shots are available for those who are immunocompromised. Correct. Um, and so the FDA uh, expanded the uh, emergency use authorization for an extra dose for individuals that are immunocompromised. And the CDC further defined that group of individuals for transplant recipients and others. Um, I think it's important to recognize that what that recommendation was, was for an additional dose. Um, the assumption being that individuals that are highly immunosuppressed may not respond as well to the both doses of the vaccine or single dose of the vaccine if they got the Johnson & Johnson or one of the single dose vaccines. Um, and that's bore out by some of the studies that have shown that maybe 20 to uh, 40 percent of individuals that are immunocompromised are going to have a response when fully vaccinated. And so giving them that extra dose. Um, I think what everyone is um, hearing now is the uh, talk of giving an actual booster. So 
an additional, a third dose or uh, an extra dose of the vaccine to uh, individuals that don't have that compromised immune system that should have had a, an appropriate response. And so that's the difference between, I think, the immune compromised and the booster um, that's being talked about, uh, I think, over the past few days in the United States as well as Israel and other countries having already kind of engaged with the, the booster itself. I see. Actually, Dr. Angaroni, there is talk about asking all Americans to get a booster shot if their second dose had been eight months ago. Is there a reason for that timing? So we don't know for sure, but this is based off of a report um, of, uh, from Pfizer, uh, who makes uh, the, uh, one of the uh, mRNA vaccines. Um, and there is a hint at their data that once you get to that six, eight month period, there's a drop off in the efficacy of the vaccine. We haven't seen that data yet. This was reported to uh, the FDA, um, and this is what Pfizer is gonna present to the FDA to get that additional dose uh, approval. Um, so we don't really know what this means, and we don't know you know, just because you have a drop in your uh, antibodies, does that really mean that there's less efficacy for the vaccine? We know that these vaccines build memory and that memory gets triggered when you're exposed to the virus. Um, and you may not have as severe of an, an infection, but you still may get infected. And so that's what we're all waiting to hear. And Dr. Kwok, I think, you know, brought this up that we don't know what the data is for the need for these booster shots. Right. Meanwhile, Dr. Lessels, you mentioned the slow vaccination campaign over in South Africa. What exactly is the COVID-19 vaccination rate there right now? Uh, so, I mean, we've vaccinated now, we've fully vaccinated about 4 million people, which is about 10% of the adult population. So, so as I mentioned, we had a late start and, and for various reasons. And then the vaccination campaign picked up speed. And but as of the last couple of weeks, it, the, 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 the kind of that that acceleration has kind of slowed down a bit. And that's that's not really about supply now in South Africa. It's about access uh, to the vaccination uh, 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 sites and and about demand creation so there's a lot of work here to to kind of plug the gaps and and uh, we've still got relatively low coverage in the most vulnerable age groups so the very elderly um, and the people with comorbidities and so the program's really trying hard at the moment to to plug those gaps I see. And against that reality, Dr. Lessels, what are your thoughts on the adoption of booster shots by countries that already have a relatively high vaccination rate? Well, I think here, I mean, it's important to separate out these two issues, as Dr. Quack and Dr. Angaroni have done, that, that clearly the, the, these extra doses for immunocompromised people, people who may not have an adequate response to, to the standard vaccination schedule. I think that's completely understandable. I think what's less understandable at the moment, um, and, and it's been highlighted very clearly by the other two guests, is this booster shot for the mass population. And I think the reality is we, we don't have the evidence at the moment to really support that. Um, and, and as Dr. Angaroni said, we're, we're kind of extrapolating from waning antibody levels, um, but without understanding that the, the real efficacy against severe disease uh, really is dropping off. And, and I think that clearly you've seen the WHO and other organizations really highlight uh, the moral failure here, that, that when we have... Um, fewer than kind of one or two percent of, of people in low income countries having received a vaccine. Um, it's clearly morally unacceptable um, to, to be giving booster shots to people in high income countries. And, and not only is it morally unacceptable, but it's clearly short sighted in terms of controlling the global pandemic. Um, and I think that that's the that's the point we have to get across that um, we still hear the words uh, that, that this is a global pandemic and we need a global response. Um, unfortunately, we don't see the action there.
Right. And Dr. Angaroni, how do you respond to the adoption of booster shots by more fortunate countries and its potential impact on the distribution of vaccine supplies to less fortunate countries? I agree with Dr. Lessel's uh, uh, statement. I think, you know, the boosters, will we need them at some point in time or will we need an additional vaccine like we do with influenza vaccine every year? That's possible. Um, but I think right now the most important thing is to get as many people around the world and within each of our individual countries vaccinated. So first time fully vaccinated before we really start pushing for these boosters or these additional doses for those of us that are going to have uh, an appropriate response. And I really think it's important for all of us um, to focus on how do we get vaccine to the countries that need it the most, to the countries that are have these lower vaccination rates, and how do we increase that vaccination rate and get more individuals vaccinated? That's the way that we start the pandemic and potentially start controlling uh, the development of these variants or the changes that can occur with these variants. Right. Dr. Clark, as Dr. Lessels mentioned, the World Health Organization has called on countries to hold off booster shots as much of the globe is struggling to secure first doses. What are your thoughts? Well, let me take a slightly different stance here. Just for the sake of keeping our conversation balanced, let me take sides with um, what the current U.S. is doing. Um, I am not entirely sure if blocking booster shots in the U.S. will actually give supplies to the unfortunate countries. Um, for, for as far as I know, at least currently, those booster shots are going to be given to mainly immunocompromised people and maybe some more number, some of uh, regular people as well. But I think uh, we need to convince these advanced countries to actually start sharing their shots to the unfortunate, rather relatively more unfortunate countries. I don't think entirely blocking them from giving the booster shots will help the situation at all. So just for the sake of keeping this conversation rather more balanced, I'm going to say that uh, rather than instead of inhibiting, trying to inhibit, prohibit uh, booster shots, we could convince these uh, uh, powerful people in the countries to start sharing more of uh, what they have overflowing uh, to the countries that need the most currently. Um, but also at the same time, as uh, speaking as, as a Korean national, I think it's very important that we also at the same time try to get the stocks for ourselves as well. We, we cannot um, possibly wait for other countries to start giving to uh, us the stocks. We need to go and get them ourselves as while um, all, all these uh, global communities are trying to work together to get the supplies for the global community as well. So just, as spe uh, just speaking as a, as a one Korean national, I think we also still need to work very hard uh, to convince um, not, uh, not just the governmental people, but also the companies to provide what they have promised before that they would provide to us. Right. Dr. Angaroni, there are concerns that vaccine inequality will aggravate the actual spread of COVID-19 across the globe amid the presence of variants, as you mentioned. What are your thoughts? So I think it, that's really important to look at as we have countries that um, are less vaccinated and those countries then become a, an incubator for the virus, for more uh, virus spread, more individuals that become infected with the virus. And that allows for changes with the virus. That allows for uh, the development of variants like the Delta variant and other variants um, that are out there. And that's where I think the importance of combating this inequality of uh, vaccination throughout the world. I do agree with, with Dr. Kwok that each country has to work on how do we get our uh, citizens vaccinated? How do we get people vaccinated? How do we get vaccines to our countries? I also think the countries that are more fortunate in having more supplies or having higher supplies work on trying to get their uh, people vaccinated, but also if there's vaccine that's left, if they have vaccine that's a surplus of vaccine, that they start figuring out how do we get that to countries in Africa, to other countries in Asia, to countries in South America or Europe that don't have access to those vaccines 
for whatever reason that that might be, whether it's from the company or whether it's from uh, lack of, of, of supply or being able to purchase those vaccines. Right. And Dr. Lessels, I direct the same question to you. What do you uh, propose to, uh, uh, do you think that the impact of vaccine inequality may actually affect the spread of COVID-19? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. I mean, Dr. Angron is, uh, I highlighted it there, that, that um, wherever the virus is, is spreading rapidly still through the population, that's where we will see new variants arising. Um, and we don't know what properties the, the next kind of new variant will, will have. And, and so that's the risk that we run. And, and that's kind of what I was saying about um, it being short-sighted, is, is that clearly the, 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 the best response for a, for a global pandemic is, is to, to kind of reduce this vaccine inequity and, and to get as many people vaccinated ac across the world as we can. Um, and and so I support. Uh, I, of course, I support what Dr. Quack said. That, that, that it may not be an either or. It may be that 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 both can be done. The the reality is though that that can happen because many of these high income countries have hoarded a vast amount of vaccines, vastly more than they need to 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 vaccinate their own population, and and so that's partly why they would be able to to do both to support lower income countries and and to give booster shots to their own uh, citizens. And and I, of course, agree that we we need to start understanding the data and, and, and start understanding what the efficacy of, of, of booster shots is. So um, it, it, there's no simple answers, as always in this pandemic, but um, it's clear that we need to do more to get vaccines to the people most in need. Of course. Meanwhile, Dr. Kwok, back here in the country, authorities here have said they will consider booster shots later this year after 70% of the population is fully vaccinated. Now, if booster shots are administered here in the country, who do you believe should be eligible? I think we are, we are going to have to follow uh, what U.S. is doing, what the U.S. is doing, and as also um, Israel is doing. We are going to have to cover the most vulnerable people first, and also most ex mostly exposed people first. So we are going to have to cover, as we have done with prior shots in their regular schedule. We're going to jab it to firstly the the medical personnel that directly care for the COVID-19 patients, such as in ICU beds or uh, or in the emergency rooms, and also to those people who hasn't. Uh, who has received but hasn't, uh, let's say, uh, built uh, immunity against the virus, such as immunocompromised people or much older generations uh, uh, possibly being exposed to the virus, we're going to have to consider them first. But also the people uh, next in line would be the next in uh, um, firefighters, police officers, and also governmental workers that, are, that have uh, greater possibilities of exposure to the virus as well. Right. Dr. Angaroni, I understand this may be a tough question, but is there a way to tackle the issue of vaccine inequality while at the same time address the need for booster shots? I think that's really difficult. Um, but I think as you know, I th all three of us have talked about, there are ways for individual nations, I think the uh, uh, national community, um, to really start thinking about this and start and Dr. Kwok, I think, already explained, you know, for Korea, how you can prioritize uh, booster vaccines for certain populations uh, to target those that might be at the highest risk, uh, to target those that are in the most need of those booster vaccines, while figuring out ways to uh, send extra vaccines to other countries or help other countries uh, gain a supply of vaccine, whether that's helping with the manufacturing of those vaccines or some of these companies that are manufacturing the vaccines, do they, can they manufacture them in other countries around the world? So the sending of those vaccines isn't as complicated uh, as we know with the Moderna and Pfizer, they have to be kept frozen, um, which is very difficult to do. So uh, Dr. Lessels is in South Africa. It's gotta be very difficult to get some of those vaccines to parts of South Africa, other parts of Africa, and other countries where you can't keep them cold. And so I think by combining both, how do we think about who needs a booster most? How do we benefit the worldwide community and 
get those vaccines, whether they're our own extra doses or, or doses from the company to those countries? And how can we help the country or the companies manufacture the vaccine or develop ways to manufacture the vaccine to get those to the countries that most need it? I do think it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. I think it's not one or the other, and it shouldn't be knee-jerk. I think that's sometimes what we've seen with this pandemic where there's one thing that comes up and everyone jumps on that to find out later that maybe that wasn't the best thing or the next big thing comes up. Um, and I really think a, an approach where we're looking at this from all different angles is probably the best way to solve that problem. Right. All right, Dr. Angaroni, thank you very much for your insights over in the U.S. And over in South Africa, Dr. Lessos, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And back here in the studio, Dr. Thank Kwak, you. thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Right. Now, as our panel of experts have said, COVID-19 is a pandemic that needs to be tackled universally. One country's triumph against it can all be short-lived as long as it continues to prevail in other nations. Thank you for watching.